I want to invite you to turn in your Bibles to Revelation chapter 2. Revelation chapter 2. I have some other passages. I have some other scriptures I'll reference, but that is the core of the message today, Revelation chapter 2. Hey, welcome to uh, day one of our corporate fast. Right? I'm glad they're excited. This This really has become a time of the year that I look forward to. It's by far, far, actually, hang on, far from my favorite time of year. But it has become a time where I look forward to intentionally recalibrating my spirit, my soul, and and my body in a fast. Hey, if you've never fasted before, all we say is just do your best. Don't allow the enemy to overwhelm you. Don't allow him to talk you out of things. Don't allow him to to cause you to feel guilty. You get to engage with expectation just because you're a part of this body, okay? We're gonna do our best for 21 days to pray and fast. At the end of that 21 days, we've got evangelist Michael Rowan. We've got coach, teacher, author, Philip and Destiny Dees, and then uh, we're bringing back a great friend of ours on that Wednesday night, Curvin Brewington. It's gonna be a great time in our Momentum Conference, and I want you to start praying with me right now. I am believing God for 100 salvations, born again, recommitted, really committed, whatever you call it, 100 salvations that Sunday night. I'm telling you, evangelist Michael Rowan is coming after souls Sunday night. You need to plan to bring some, don't just be there, bring somebody with you. It's gonna be a great time. We'll tell you more about it. Hey, I I asked a question last week. I asked, what is discipleship? And I'm not gonna take another 20 minutes, God help me today, but um, if you missed that, I want you to go back and just give, give 20 minutes to that 40 minute message because I broke that down in a way that I don't have time for today, but I do wanna come back and kind of lighten the mood a little. I know that last week was a little heavy because we looked at the biblical definition of discipleship versus what we believed formally about discipleship. And there was a little bit of contention there. And I know that more than one person left, maybe even feeling a little overwhelmed. So I sat down with our staff first thing Tuesday morning, not Monday, which stinks and puts us behind. And I love taking off on Monday. It's a great thing for our staff. Um, We sat down on Tuesday morning and I asked this question. I said, hey, what is discipleship? I wanna give you some of the phrases that they came up with. I might not give you time to write these down. You can take a snapshot if you're watching online. It's there on the screen. If you wanna go back and look, you're welcome to. What is discipleship? One of our staff members said very simply, imparting how you've grown into someone else. Imparting how you've grown into someone else. Another person said, duplicating into others what God has done in you. I like both of those. It's just two different ways to say a similar thing, impart or duplicate. In other words, this person, these two people understood, it's not enough for you to just say that you're saved. That's not discipleship, that's salvation. Discipleship begins at salvation. I've actually heard and sat through a forum. If you, have you sat through a forum recently? on theology. I mean, who knew people could make the Bible boring? I sat through a forum and they discussed this one question. Are people saved by discipleship or discipled to be saved? Which one? Does salvation come or discipleship? Which one comes first? And ultimately, after listening to everybody argue for a little while, we basically decided that God can use both processes. Inviting, I like this one. This simplifies the whole thing. I probably should have just given this one. What is discipleship? Inviting someone along in your journey to know Jesus. Do not let the devil overcomplicate this thing. Hey, by the way, God didn't give you your job just so you could earn an income. He put you in that place, at that school, on that campus, in that office. He gave you that business so that you could do this. You were not born to wake up every morning and just make money. 
I'm for making money. I like to make money. I need you to make money. Like, it's a great thing. <laughs> Praise God. Thank you for supporting our ministry habits, okay? That's why I tell my sister. I need you to work. Like, we can't all just be up here all the time. <laughs> it's awesome. But, it's, but God gave you that job so you could do this. God gave you that, that classroom. He gave you that desk. He gave you that spot. He put you in that restaurant, in that line, on that aisle. What is discipleship? Discipleship is devoting your entire being to fulfill every aspect of Jesus's teaching. Every aspect. Guys, I think, I think that this would include the great commandment and the great commission. Like, I don't think you can say that you are living by the greatest commandment if you don't see yourself fulfilling the great commission. That was the challenging piece last week. It's a burning desire to be like Jesus, completely devoted to accomplish his will for your life. I'm gonna come back to that. Um, my, my wife said last week, you know, I love the student versus disciple. Uh, explanation, the teacher versus the rabbi. You can go back and watch that. My bride said, I, I feel like I started as a student, but I became a disciple. And I'm still becoming a disciple. So a burning desire to be like Jesus. Um, here's the last one, and I think that this one's important. I need you to understand, I don't personally believe, and I think that the Bible states pretty clearly, it's not discipleship until the person you are discipling makes a disciple. See, we call discipleship leading someone to Jesus. That's salvation, and that's essential. What must a man do to be born again, asked Nicodemus. How can a man be saved, said the Philippian jailer. Well, believe in the name of the Lord Jesus and you and your whole household, great. Now you're born again, congratulations. You have an infant. We get people saved, we call that discipleship. That's not discipleship, that's having a baby. You're not like, all right, you're saved, good luck, yeah, and then walk away, next. That's not what you do with babies, you don't like have a baby and like, oh, sweet, next. <laughs> it's not how that works. It, the life doesn't begin until the child is born. Now, come on, are you with me? Now the discipleship process begins. And yes, your marriage is a discipleship process. Yes, your parenting is a discipleship process. Yes, if you're an employer, that's a discipleship process. If you have people around you, hey, your singleness in Christ, your family, your friends, just as valuable as my marriage, all of those things should involve the discipleship process. So, so here's my, stop, stop cutting the process short and calling it discipleship. Here's what I need you to see. It's not discipleship until the person I'm discipling makes a disciple. That's discipleship. And then that person makes a disciple that makes a disciple. We like to look and go, okay, well, they're discipling somebody now. No, 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 no. It's not discipling until they too are making a disciple. Guys, that's why so many people fall off the wagon because they're not really on the wagon. I wanna prophesy this over this house this morning as more than just another series that we're doing. We prayerfully considered this. Our series for this three weeks leading into Momentum has become a prophetic word for us in prayer, and I want you to pray it too. This time is different. This year, it really is different. This fast is different. Th this invite, this, this prayer life, this time when you get in this book, 
You may have read that passage a thousand times before, but we are believing God that this year, this time, this prayer, this semester of groups, it's just going to be different than it has been before. Come on, we're not, we're not just making resolutions this morning and hoping to keep them until February. We're not just gonna make commitments and overpromise and underdeliver. No, this year, this time, this fast, this prayer, this study, this group, this year is this time in the name of Jesus. We're going to make the commitment and we're going to come through. Come on, somebody. This time is different. My wife came up to me just to illustrate the point. She didn't know we were going into this series. When she told me this on December 31st, last Sunday, she didn't know this was the series we were going into this week. She caught me right before worship was finished right before I went up to preach. And she said, I think I have a word, which was automatically like, where's the microphone, girl? I'll let you share it with everybody. You know, she's like, uh, uh-uh, no, I'm gonna tell you. And so she told, she told me, I feel like I just had a vision. And I was like, what? She said, I saw, I saw weeds getting plucked up and pulled out of the ground, but then they came back. And this time, they develop roots. She said, I believe that the Lord allowed people to be plucked out in the past like weeds, but they're about to come back. They're gonna come back and this time, it's gonna be different. This time, come on, that prodigal is gonna develop roots. This time, that addiction is gonna be broken. This time, that person is gonna grow in their relationship with Jesus. This time, that root system is gonna spread out in the winter, and by the time the spring comes around, there's gonna be a sprout that turns into a shoot, that turns into some branches connected to Jesus that actually, maybe for the first time, or for the first time in a long time, begin to develop fruit for the kingdom of God. This time, says the Lord. It's more than a phrase. It's more than a series. It is a proclamation that will be backed up with fasting and prayer. This time is different. Paul warned. This is not just a year of discipleship. This is the year of discipleship. Paul warned the church that we're gonna read about in Revelation chapter two, he warned their elders in Acts chapter 20. Acts chapter 20, verse 29. One of my memory verses is verse 24, and I I mess it up in layman's terms, but I know what it means to me. Paul is looking at these elders and these leaders. He says, hey, look, you know, I'm not gonna see you anymore, and I need you to understand this. My life is worth nothing unless... I complete the task and accomplish the ministry to which the Lord Jesus has called me. My life, I see no value in being alive, says the Apostle Paul, unless I use my job to lead people to Jesus. I see no value in owning that company and going to that school and sitting in that class, walking that hallway, being at that office or that station or that campus or that restaurant or that store unless... I don't see a purpose in waking up tomorrow morning unless I accomplish, complete the task, and fulfill the ministry that Jesus Christ has laid on my heart. Guys, that's discipleship. And then he gets down to verse 29 and he says, look, I know false teachers, uh, naysayers, negative people are gonna come into the picture like vicious wolves. By the way, they're gonna be dressed like sheep. And you're gonna need the spiritual discernment in 2024. I didn't say this in first service. This is for somebody. You're gonna need the discernment in 2024 to tell the difference between a sheep that is a child of God and a wolf that is dressed in the clothing of a child of God. They will come like vicious wolves among you after I leave. In other words, when you ain't at church, come on somebody when you're not in the worship center, when the atmosphere's not conducive. It's not gonna feel like Resurrection Sunday. It's gonna feel like Fat Tuesday. Come on, somebody. Y'all ain't helping me this morning. Which, by the way, Jesus could come back on Fat Tuesday. I'm just telling you. 
Like you might not get Wednesday. I ain't got time to preach that sermon today. Not, <laughs> I felt that. Not sparing, not sparing, not sparing the flock. Don't you assume that you've got tomorrow? The wolf might get you today. Verse 30, even some men from your own, in other words, he's looking around and saying, hey, some of y'all gonna be the one. Paul looked, I'm talking, he wasn't looking at 100 people. He was looking at a few people. And he said, one of you, you're a wolf. <laughs> and nobody slapped him, they took it. There will be people within this group that will rise up, distort the truth, tell you that God doesn't really mean it that way, that preacher doesn't need to preach it that way. I can't, I gotta keep going. One will rise up and distort the truth in order to draw their own following and draw people away from that place, away from the move of God. Here's what Paul was saying. The enemy is going to distract you. The enemy is gonna put people around you to distract you. They're gonna try to convince you, the enemy and the enemy in the people. They're gonna try to convince you that spending time in God's word is not worth your time. That got a better amen in first service. They're gonna try to convince you that you don't need to get up early or stay up late to develop your prayer life. That you don't need to fast lunch and pray instead that you don't need to engage in this corporate opportunity to disconnect from the things that you've been spending too much time in so that you can reconnect with the one that could actually make your time eternally valuable. I'm preaching now. The enemy's gonna come and tell you that prioritizing Sunday services is not as valuable as sleeping in. Come on, somebody. They're gonna, the enemy's gonna tell you, come on, the enemy's gonna tell you that a service in the name of Jesus, gathering together in the name of Jesus is an option. Every Everything else is mandatory. In other words, on Wednesday morning, you're not gonna ask them if they wanna get up and go to school, but on Wednesday night, you're gonna ask them if they want. I can't get no help on this side, so I gotta preach this thing. That prioritizing the name of the Lord, the presence of the Lord, studying the word of the Lord, and hearing from the Lord is not the most valuable thing that you could do that day. Sitting alone with Jesus in silence, not just showing up and telling him everything you want. The enemy is going to discourage you and distract you from signing up for that group because you already did that. By the way, if you got that attitude, you missed the reason you did it. The enemy's gonna convince you about two or three weeks into this thing that you don't need to go to that group because you don't need to just listen to them people whine. Uh-huh, yeah, yeah. I've been there, heard all the stuff. Wolves. The enemy's gonna tell you that fasting and disconnecting from the distractions is not worth your time. That preacher doesn't have the right to call you to a fast even though it's biblical. Only the Holy Spirit can tell you to fast. You're right but he can tell you later to call you to something that you wouldn't have otherwise done. Come on, somebody. That's what he did to me. That's why I did the Daniel fast. That's why I do liquids for seven days. That's why I learned how to, to do water only for a few days. I'm not doing that this year. That's why, how I learned intermittent. That's how I learned how to stop drinking other things that I wouldn't, my God, I can't get no. Did you know that some Christians go there and Christians go their entire lives without fasting? and wonder why they got more doubt than they have faith? When Jesus said, well, I mean, other churches fast and, and they made it a formality, then don't make it a formality. Do this thing unto the Lord with all of your heart as unto God and not to man. This is the purpose of why we disconnect and this is the purpose of why we draw near. Paul warned them, Paul warned them. And then Jesus in Revelation, see, I told you we get to Revelation. I told y'all. In Revelation chapter two, verse two, Jesus said, I know all the things you do. Some of y'all heard this before, like, ah, oh, I know this passage, good. Pretend like you never heard the word of God in this way before and let it come alive for the first time. Because Jesus is about to talk to a group of people that started well. They were bottle rockets. <laughs> what now? 
Now, look, I ain't got a problem with bottle rockets. Don't put them in a BB gun and aim them at me, but you know. Just... In fact, you know what we might do today? Just, I was thinking about this earlier. I think we might take our prayer cards or the pictures or the things that we were praying, and I think we might light that thing and send it up into the sky just as an illustration for our children that we're putting this before the Lord. We're not gonna do that every day, but spiritually we are. Why? Because his mercies are made new every morning. Jesus said, I know all the things you do. I've seen your, your hard work. Yeah, you work hard, good. You're supposed to work hard. Well, I got a real job. I'll trade. Your patient endurance. Oh, I lost some of y'all. <laughs> I know, <laughs> I know you don't tolerate evil people. All the patient endurance people are like, yeah, that was me. I, that right there, I don't tolerate evil people. You've examined the claims of those who say they are apostles, who say they're leaders of leaders, but, but they're not. And you discover that they're liars. Like you don't just let anybody say whatever they want to. And, and you don't even act the wrong way. You say the right thing the right way. You work hard. You endure. You have patiently suffered for me. Anybody go through something difficult in 2023? I know some people. You know what? They stayed. They could have quit. They could have doubted God. They could have rejected God. They could have got mad at God. But they didn't. They suffered without quitting. Verse 4. But I have this complaint against you. You don't love me or each other like you used to. I don't raise your hand, but I wonder if that describes anybody in here on January 7th, the first day of a fast. I wonder if there's anybody listening to me who used to love Jesus more than they do right now. I wonder if there's anybody in this house who had a zeal for Jesus in the past that they do not have in the present. I wonder if there's anybody in this room or watching online right now that would honestly say, I used to be on fire for God in a way that I am not currently on fire for God. I used to feel him. I used to sense him. I used to serve him. My zeal for Jesus was greater in the past than it is in the present. Jesus said, I have this complaint against you. You don't love me the way you did at first. You're doing all the right things. You carry the conviction. You're getting overwhelmed by the definition of discipleship. The church of Ephesus had a unique challenge. Ephesus was the home of the imperial's, uh, emperor's cult. They worshiped the goddess Artemis or Artemis with impurity and immorality. I see little ears, so that's all I'm explaining. It was a tough place. Come on, it was Bourbon Street in Ephesus every day. And these people are being commended by Jesus in that atmosphere. Come on, they tested teachers. They held people accountable. They served the right way. They worked the right way. They endured hardship the right way. Come on, they were one of the first hundred that stayed when that crazy little overzealous 32-year-old showed up in 2016 with way too much energy and way too little experience. Can I get some help today? They are the group of 80 that were here the summer before we showed up. They didn't leave with the great wave of people. They stayed. They endured. They suffered the hardship. They lost some loved ones. They did the right thing. They persevered without growing weary. They suffered, but they didn't quit. And Jesus says, but I have this complaint against them. Their zeal for Jesus became religious. I'm not talking about another doctrine or system of faith today. I'm talking about us. They begin to check the boxes. Now, I don't have, a, I don't have an issue with boxes. I, I, I like to-do list. I'm, I'm very task-oriented. Like, I, I don't even like being interrupted while I'm trying to do one. 
My wife and I are sandpaper for one another. She's, she calls herself a multitasker. I'm like, no, you just don't ever finish anything. <laughs> well, you get stuck on one something. It's like, I don't ever start nothing new. Right, that's why we work good together. It's, listen, you made living for Jesus about going through the motions. What God is saying is, you used to have this intimate relationship with Jesus. And something, something happened and it became some kind of ritual or mundane routine for you. Watch what he says. I, I want you to go back. Verse five, he says, look how far you have fallen. Ouch. That's not me, I, I haven't fallen. No, be careful. Be careful assuming that your greatest days of conviction are behind you. Well, I, I'm doing my best. I'm a, oh, hang on, hang on, hang on. This is, this is not a, a statement that should be condemnational. When the Lord looks at you and says, you have fallen, what he's saying is you have a need. This is a statement of repentance. Look at the next phrase. He says, look, you got one responsibility. Yeah, study. Yeah, pray. Yeah, fast. Yeah, give. Yeah, serve. Invest in your community. Show up at your office. Be early and stay late. Don't give your best to everybody else and give your family your leftovers. Don't minister well to people you don't know and treat your spouse like trash. Come on, somebody. Turn back to me. Come on, catch this. And do the work that you did at first. Do the things that you did when you first fell in love with me. Come on, when you first made the covenant, when you first got married to Jesus, when you stepped out of darkness and into light, when you realized that you were lost and dying in your sin, but now you're resurrected with Christ your Savior and you just can't get enough time in this book, presence in prayer, and you just gotta know the next thing that God wants you to do. You wanna be discipled because you have a burning desire to be like Jesus. It's all that matters to you. Everything else is a byproduct of who you are. It's not the definition of who you are. Do the work you did at first. I don't know about you, but when Megan and I first met, well, this isn't realistic. And that's why you're roommates. When Jesus and I first met, when I first came back to him, come on, this is what I, this is what I do love about the fast. It's an opportunity to recalibrate and remember that the only reason I'm different is because God made me that way. Look how far you have fallen. Turn back to me. Do the works you did at first. Matthew chapter six, it's a tough read, man. Hey, when you give, don't expect anything in return. Don't even tell anybody what you gave if you're gonna celebrate yourself. Well, you told everybody what you gave. Yeah, as an example, not in arrogance. When you pray, Go hide in the secret. And what you pray in the secret will be seen by others in public. Can I confess that I love fasting and praying because it helps me remember that I don't need to pray better in front of you than I do over her. Because I'm good at praying in front of you. And Jesus reminds us that when you fast, wash your face. And remember who you're doing it for. Then he continues, he says things like, hey, do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy. Do not worry about tomorrow. Well, that's easy for you to say, Jesus. Like when you know what's gonna happen tomorrow, you give me like a detailed list of what's gonna happen, I won't worry about it. Now he said, look, 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 all these things aside, 
You've got one job. It's not in your notes. Verse 33, it's a memory verse. Seek first the kingdom. And all these other things, that will be a byproduct. You won't, you won't define yourself by the things that are just supposed to complement you. You will know who you are you'll turn back to me. I think Paul, Paul helped the church when he proclaimed the letter to them. Ephesians chapter two, verse one. Remember, Revelation two is about the church in Ephesus. And Paul says this in verse one. Once you were dead. Hey, if you're not in Christ today, I don't, I, here, I'm just gonna go ahead and go. If I mean, first Sunday, 2024, I'm gonna help somebody. You can't accuse me for the rest of the year. If you're not in Christ, you're going to hell. You're a dead person walking. That's what Paul said. Not because God wants to send you to hell. You have to step over the dead body of his son to get to hell. That's how much he loves you. But for those of you who believe and know that you are in Christ, we need to remember, once you were dead. Why? Because of your disobedience and your many sins. I was thinking about this earlier today. Did you know that there is nothing that you can do that God hasn't already had to forgive somebody else for? Come on, I'm, I'm trying to help somebody this morning that's been overwhelmed by guilt. No, 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 God already forgave that. He just wants to do it in you too. Did you know, uh, our Pastor Blaine reminded me of this one morning. Did you know that there's nothing that you can pray for that God hadn't already provided? <laughs> Did you know there's nothing you can talk to God about that he hadn't already had a conversation about? You were once dead because of your disobedience and your many sins. Look at this, verse two. You used to live in sin. Here's what he's saying. You used to do all those things on 2nd Street. No, no, no. Some of y'all go to Mamu so y'all won't see me there. That's... <laughs> I ain't driving to Mamu to catch you. I got better... <laughs> And stop unfollowing me on social media during that season too. <laughs> Be getting blocked just for existing. <laughs> Wouldn't be so funny if it wasn't so true. <laughs> watch, watch what he said. This is Paul. You're obeying the devil. I didn't say it, he said it. The commander of the powers in the unseen world. He is the spirit. He's the one that's at work in the hearts of those. God bless. He is the one that is at work in the hearts of those who refuse to read this book and do what it says. Because that's what it means to refuse to obey God. It means to look at something that God did something that God was, something that God said, and assume that he only meant that for somebody else. We're not doing it to perform for God. No, no, no. My daddy doesn't need me to perform for him, but he sure is pleased when I honor him. Yeah. Turn back to me. I wanna close with this idea today. Never forget how fallen you were. Come on, church. Never forget how fallen you were because when you forget how fallen you were, you will make the mistake of assuming that you have arrived somewhere. When you forget how fallen you were, you will look down your nose at people who are still more fallen than you. Yeah, that's how it went over in first service too. Never forget how fallen you were. February, 2006. I sat before Megan. We put one another through a lot. If you wanna hear more of the details of that, you can go watch that series last November we did, Confessions of a Pastor. I don't wanna relive all that all over, over and over again. I think some people make more of who they used to be than who they are in Christ today. And I just said, that's not, that's not how I like to preach. But I sat with Megan, broken, messed up, 
21 years old, and I said, Megan, I have, I have served God before. And she got frustrated. She looked back at me. She's like, what do you, what do you want? Like, what do you expect? It's just like a miracle to happen today and we just act like nothing happened? And I said, that is exactly what I asked God to do on the way over here today. Because I know you've heard me say, I'm sorry before. I know you've heard me say, I'll never do it again. But there was a time in my life when I was living for Jesus. And I'm telling you right now, I'm gonna follow Jesus with all of my heart from this day forward. And as long as I'm following Jesus, you can trust God to trust me. If I ever stop following Jesus, then you need to get away from me because I will break you and lead you astray. That was February, 2006. That seems like a lifetime ago. It was just 10 years before I became the lead pastor here at this church in 2016. That shocked me this week. I've been here eight years, but you Cajuns make time fly. Y'all for real. I'm talking, I came here with no gray hair. I can't pull out enough now. Pull one out, it's like dragon heads just sprouting up everywhere. Losing some of it, either that or it's going in and coming out other places. I ain't figured out which one's happening yet. But all I know is before 2016, it wasn't happening. Megan, I will follow Jesus with all of my heart from this day forward. Here's what I was saying. This time, it's different. This time. Come on. I know you've been praying for that loved one, but I'm telling you, this was, God laid this on our heart. This time it's different. This prayer is different. This commitment is different. This year is different. This group is different. This church is different. Verse four, because of his great love for us. Come on, isn't he good? I know you went through what feels like hell on earth, but because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive in Christ even when we were dead. We were dead people walking. We had no purpose. We had no plan. We had no eternal value. And God said, no, no, no. You may not see the value, but you have so much inside of you that I'll give you my first and I'll give you my best just so that you can see something that you don't currently find within. We were dead and now we're alive in Christ. This time is different. Been raised from the dead, you're born again. It's not enough to just say that you're saved. Come on, your being, your essence. We need this in this generation. If we don't raise up a group of people that believe this, this world full of wolves will chew them up and spit them out and they will blame God for it. People in the church will try to take out your people but not if they got the Spirit of God on the inside. They'll be able to discern the difference between a sheep and a wolf dressed like one, and they will serve the God who is the lamb that was slain, but the lion that was raised. This time is different. This year is different. I'm telling you, this fast is different. Some of you were here seven years ago. I feel it in my spirit. This time we have Michael Rowan. It's gonna be even more than it was before. You may have been plucked out in the past. You may have been like a weed that grew overnight and fell off the wagon for whatever reason. But I came to prophesy into this place today. We're proclaiming it and we're gonna fast and pray it for 21 days. This time is different. You're gonna develop relationship with Jesus that causes a sprout of a tree trunk to branch out of Christ who is our vine and you because of who you are in him will develop the fruit of the kingdom of God unlike you have ever developed it before and so will the people that you're praying for if you believe God for it give him 10 seconds of praise like he's already done it father we bless your name let it be more than a series. Let it be more than a phrase, God. 
It's different this time. This building program is different. Come on, some of y'all were here last time. This is different. This semester of groups is different. This is a prophetic word for this house. I'm gonna read this scripture, I gotta pray. My Lord, that thing is fast. Ephesians chapter four, verse 15. I know what you used to do. I know how you used to behave. I know what everybody else is doing. But instead, everybody proclaim that. Instead, say it with me. Instead, we will speak the truth in love. We grew weary, we grew cold, I don't care, it's over, it's done, put it under the blood. Because this year, we are going to grow more and more like Jesus. Here's discipleship. It is living your life to be like Jesus. Hey, if you just committed your life to Christ, or maybe you recommitted your life to Jesus, listen, we wanna celebrate with you and connect with you. The best way that we do that is through a text. Would you text I believe to 84576? It is as simple as that. Again, that's I believe to 84576. We have a team standing by that would love to connect with you. They want to celebrate with you. In fact, we even want to pray with you. All you have to do is go to our website, eunicechurch.com, or you can download our church app, New Hope Eunice. Either way, we have a prayer request tab that you can fill out right there that goes directly to our team and our staff. And we would love to start this journey with you, connecting with you and celebrating with you. While you're on that, check out all of our events that we have going on here at New Hope. Man, join a small group, sign up for Next Steps, and we can promise you this, that this will be your church home and you can find a place here. Before you go, simply open up your hands like I'm handing you a gift, and please let me pray a special blessing over you right now. God, I pray, Lord, for every person watching, that you would bless your people. God, that you would shine your face upon us and be gracious to us. Lord, lift up your countenance upon us and give us your peace. And help us, Holy Spirit, to anoint us and to accomplish the vision that you have given us here at New Hope, and that is to meet people and grow closer to you together. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Thank you again for watching and stay tuned for anything and everything that we have going on here at New Hope. God bless.